really had a chance to look at it. I, I thought I was going to be able to look at it today, but I'm gonna send it. I'm gonna send you some of this stuff right now. He's, he's like hyper prolific, man. He's got like a billion things, and all, they all look like something that. I want to read. Yeah. Um, but he's got something called the 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 aesthetic of Exodus. Oh, the okay. Aesthetics of Exodus. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna send it. Buona sera. <laughs> Good evening. Buona sera. <laughs> We have uh, reached the, the end of uh, the summer school uh, in uh, global studies and uh, critical theory. This is uh, the last public uh, event. We have been working uh, over the last uh, two weeks uh, basically along two axes, technology and life on the one end, race and abolition on the other end. The Academy of Global Humanities and Critical Theory has been organizing the summer school since 2014. And I must say that the summer school uh, has uh, nurtured uh, projects, uh, events, connections, uh, friendships, uh, even beyond uh, the two weeks uh, spent uh, each year in uh, Bologna. This year's edition was uh, a kind of uh, experiment. We were uh, compelled to hold the summer school online. It was uh, impossible to bring uh, people from uh, any corner of the world uh, to Bologna. As far as uh, I understand uh, speaking uh, with participants in the summer school, uh, it was nevertheless uh, kind of uh, exciting uh, and thought-provoking uh, edition. So precisely because uh, this year's uh, edition of the summer school uh, was uh, a kind of experiment, uh, I thought uh, uh, it would be nice uh, to conclude it, uh, not with uh, a classical, academic uh, lecture, but uh, with a kind of assembly. And in this uh, assembly, we will discuss about uh, the topics uh, of uh, this year's uh, edition of the summer school. But more generally, I think uh, we should take uh, today's event as an occasion to test the very idea of uh, a summer school uh, in uh, critical theory and uh, global uh, studies. I would like uh, to quote uh, Sun Li, a, photo a photographer uh, that uh, plays an important role in uh, Stefano Harney's and Fred Morton's uh, last book. Sun Li says that we have to renew our habits of assembly, although or because we cannot physically come together right now due to the pandemic. Let me say that no one is more suited for uh, such an assembly than uh, Fred and Stefano. <laughs> I guess uh, many of you are uh, familiar with uh, their individual work and uh, in particular with their uh, collaborative work 
which connects uh, in a very nice way to the topics uh, dealt with uh, in uh, this year's edition of uh, the summer school. They have a theory of uh, logistical capitalism uh, that uh, has much to say about uh, the relation between uh, technology and life. They write in the spirit uh, of the black radical tradition. And so they have really much to say about uh, race and uh, abolition. Mm -hmm. Fred and Stefano are uh, the authors uh, of uh, Under Commons, a book that came out in 2013 and has been uh, translated into several uh, languages. The Italian edition of Under Commons just came out from Tamu. And let me say that uh, it is uh, a wonderful edition. It has been uh, translated by a collective of people who have worked together on the book and who have written two texts that uh, make the Italian edition uh, unique. It's a kind uh, of new book. It's a book uh, that instantiates uh, the productivity of translation when uh, translation is taken uh, as a conceptual and political task, and not merely as a linguistic task. I was saying that the book came out from TAMU, a new press based in Naples that is doing a really amazing work. And please double check their website. Under Commons continues to spur lively debates uh, in many parts of the world. And in particular, it continues to nurture practices of flight and undermining of uh, what uh, they call uh, logistical capitalism. This is really what one uh, can call a generative book. <laughs> A new book by Fred and Stefano recently came out from uh, Mind of Compositions. The title is All Incomplete. And I guess tonight uh, we'll have uh, a chance uh, to discuss also about uh, this uh, new book. <laughs> so I would like uh, to start by asking Stefan and Fred to introduce uh, themselves and to talk a bit uh, about their uh, collaborative uh, work. And among other things, uh, their collaborative work uh, can be defined as friendship uh, in action. Mm -hmm. Friendship among them, but also with a multitude of comrades uh, dead and living, a possible instance of uh, what they call uh, under commons. So please, I don't know who is going to start, uh, Stefan or Fred. Uh, I can start. Go ahead. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sandro. It's, it's, it's great to be back with you and, uh, and to feel our, our long friendship. And thank you everyone for, for coming out uh, this evening and, and, and for listening. Um, we feel especially grateful to be in this conversation in this assembly right now, because as Sandro mentioned, we've, we've just had the benefit of having the undercommons translated and published in Italian. Uh, and indeed, as my friend, our friend uh, Paolo Do recently said to me, the, the book in Italian is better than the book in English. Uh, and I, I like that idea a lot. <laughs> um, Fred and I have been working together 
writing together for probably 15 to 18 years now. Uh, we've been friends even much longer than that. Um, I think that the order uh, of, the, of that, of friendship and then of, uh, of writing together is, isn't accidental and has been especially generative because it's meant that one of the things that we started with was, was a practice of, of friendship. Uh, certainly in the English speaking world, uh, real friendship am amongst men is, uh, is rare. In fact, it, uh, most of what we call male friendship is really just a conspiracy against women. Um, and we've tried to practice something else from that over these years. And part of that practice became writing and part of that practice became uh, what you might call a uh, as they popularly do today, an expanded practice where, where being friends allowed us also to be friends with others and to increase the way in which we can practice a, 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 a social life together uh, in the face of the individuating machines and the logistical capitalism that, that Sandro um, has, has rightly mentioned. And so today, with this assembly, we, we, we seek just to expand once again uh, those friendships and that conversation and this, and this practice. Uh, and we're, we're grateful uh, that you're giving us this opportunity and, and grateful to be back with Sandro. So uh, with that, I, I'll pass it over to Fred so that we have time to, to get into conversation and to answer some of the questions that came in. Um, yeah, thanks, Stefano. Thank you, Sandro, so much for um, for introducing us. And and uh, it's I wish we could be there in person with all our friends, but we're at least happy to be there in in, in whatever way that, that we can. Um, I guess only thing I really want to add to what Stefano says is that I'm also very happy to hear that the book that the undercommons is better in Italian than in English. Um, it makes me wonder if maybe that's because in a certain sense, the book was was coming closer to home uh, in a certain way, not, not only in so far as we were very much interested in, in and influenced by, by Italian thinkers, but, but maybe in a more general sense that it was that there's some sort of amazing, interesting relay that maybe we've been on uh, between the Mediterranean and the and the Caribbean that 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 very much uh, traces a, a route that was also crucial, obviously for for African people um, and for the Black radical tradition too, and and maybe over the course of the last ten years we've been coming to see that, coming to understand that, um, coming to understand what it means to be involved in a tradition of thought that that is concerned with and that faces the sea as much as it's concerned with and and grounded, so to speak, on the land. Um, and uh, you know that 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 seaborne thought is uh, is something that we want to continue to investigate and to 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 live with. Um, and uh, anyway, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that today too. So any, just uh, thank you very much. So let's, I'm happy to get to the questions too. So we have a, a set of questions coming from uh, participants in uh, the summer school and uh, I uh, would like to start uh, with uh, Nico, who asked three questions. <laughs> I shared them with uh, Fred and Stefano, but I will read uh, the first one. You have criticized universities as machines for extraction and stratification with critical academics even at the art of it. <laughs> One could even follow David Graeber's model 
By describing faculty as mere box tickets and task master. In his assessment, valuable work is that which is characterized by care. <laughs> is it possible for an academic to transform his work into a labor of care and how? Uh, I'll, maybe we can both try this, but I'll just start by, by saying that uh, uh, all three of these questions were very thought provoking and, and thank you for, <clears throat> for sharing them with us. Uh, when, I, when I tried to think about this, of course, uh, we all have certain ways of reading and, and, and I think our way of reading is to, is to look for some of the pitfalls in, in strategies uh, where one has to rely on oneself as, a, as an individual in these machines. And so I think in a way, a short answer to the question is that it's not possible for an academic to convert her, his, their work into a work of care uh, because it's not possible for the individual academic really to do anything uh, of significance uh, for for any form of resistance or alternative life uh, by themselves, uh, and once we once we move from uh, an individual strategy of negotiating the institution, which of course can easily mean I I will take care with my work and my teaching, and I will try to fight. The, the, the move towards the, the commercialization of my work or the um, professionalization of my work, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's natural that we have a moment where we think like that, I think. But I think it's very important to, to try to reassert the sociality of our work to try to de-individuate our efforts so that we can begin to form an idea of care, form an idea of, of study that is, as we are often quoting, a, a form that is take, allows for difference without separability, as Denise Ferreira da Silva says, that is, our care should be in difference, not in individuating uh, or, or authorizing uh, or citing our work in a certain kind of way. So I, I think that we should always be looking for new forms of, of collectivity when we, when we move in and through uh, and across uh, institutions. And, and in those forms of collectivity, in those forms of study, resistances will arise, struggles will arise because the moment that you try to work collectively, the moment that you uh, forego the individuating professional career is the moment that you come into conflict with the institution. But, but, it, but we believe that the kind of conflict that you come in when you work collectively, when you study collectively, it's very different from the kind of conflict that you come in when you yourself are just trying to get, gain academic freedom or just trying to gain recognition or, or just trying to gain the space to work. Uh, those conflicts, uh, you know, are, are bourgeois conflicts and, and, and will trap us uh, in, in a, a certain circle. And that's really what we mean when we talk about the critical uh, intellectual being central to that institutional uh, system. The critical intellectual is essentially the, the carries out the reforms the institution is incapable of carrying out and yes, nonetheless relies on. Uh, and, and we seek something, something different. Um, yeah, I, I, comments I, or questions from uh, the audience? <laughs> Uh, 
uh, several uh, people here involved uh, in uh, students' politics in Bologna. So it would be nice to hear uh, what they have to say. <laughs> but let's listen to Fred first. <laughs> um, again, I don't, I don't know that I have very much to add at all, really, to, to what Stefano just said. I think maybe, maybe just to accentuate something that I heard in what you said, man, that, that actually has me excited a bit. Um, just uh, the moment at which you said strategy, and in a weird way, I guess in my mind, the word that I was thinking of was ethics. Um, so that on the one hand, you know, what's implicit, um, you know, that, that to the extent that, that what we're engaged in, particularly, you know, in the wake of Cedric Robinson's work and what so much of what All Incomplete is about is a kind of a refusal of the metaphysical foundations of politics as, as, as we know politics and as we understand politics. Mm -hmm. But it was also then mean a, a refusal of the metaphysical foundations of ethics, which are based on, you know, uh, in the, which, you know, in, in the, in the normal conception of ethics is all is predicated on, you know, the, the, the metaphysical assumption of individual individuals in relation, you know, um, and so, um, but, but now what's also at stake it seems to me and what you were saying is, is that we need a new conception of strategy too, um, in a way that will also allow us to detach strategy from those metaphysical foundations. And, and even, and maybe even a more exciting way that, that in detaching strategy from those metaphysical foundations, we actually create a new way of understanding the intensity of the interplay of strategy and ethics, you know, um, which is, and I guess what I would say just very simply then is if, if that's the case, if that's true, um, and I'm sure somebody must have said this or thought of this before, I just don't know who it, who it is, but, but if that's true, um, you know, then, then it would play itself out at, as, as a kind of thing where you're like, um, It just it just it just foregrounds the 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 interplay of how we fight with with what we want, right? That 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 we fight for what we want by enacting what what we want, you know. Um, that uh, that the ethical outcome of our actions will have been, you know, simply the 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 extension, you know. Of, of our of our strategic you know moves and movements and, and planning um, anyway that's that's what came to my mind when you were talking so um, anyway well just to give a bit uh, of background to this uh, discussion uh, uh, we participated uh, together uh, in a project uh, some 15 years ago that was called uh, EduFactory. And that was a project uh, uh, launched at the height of uh, the so-called anomalous wave in Italy the student movement uh, of uh, 2008 to 2010. And EduFactory was uh, really a kind of uh, transnational network where uh, students collective uh, were uh, discussing uh, with uh, quite uh, important uh, critical thinkers. And uh, maybe the main question uh, behind the project uh, was about uh, the possibility of uh, autonomous institutions. 
autonomous institutions uh, in the field of uh, knowledge uh, production. <laughs> there were some uh, quite successful uh, experiments, uh, and there were also uh, some attempts uh, to open up the space for autonomous institutions uh, within the academy. If we take seriously what uh, Fred uh, and Stefan write about uh, logistical capitalism, uh, it is quite difficult to imagine the possibility of an outside, a kind of uh, pure outside. And so the question is uh, once again, uh, whether uh, it is possible to open up uh, autonomous uh, spaces, uh, even to build autonomous institutions uh, within the academy, or to put it uh, with uh, the old uh, workerist uh, slogan, within and against uh, the uh, academy. As far as I am concerned, uh, uh, in the last uh, decade, uh, I have been experimenting with this kind uh, of uh, project uh, or practice. Uh, and I must say that uh, uh, at least uh, uh, sometimes uh, we were uh, successful. So I think an important question also for uh, our uh, summer school uh, is the one about the conditions that allow this opening up of autonomous uh, spaces uh, within the institutional framework of uh, the uh, academy. And in a way, for me, uh, the notion of uh, under commons uh, makes an important uh, contribution to this search. And this is also because uh, an under common uh, is possible everywhere. So it is possible to create uh, something like an under common. Uh, even uh, during a class in uh, a normal uh, course at uh, the university. Maybe my uh, question uh, uh, with respect to this uh, has to do uh, with the conditions that uh, allow the networking, the multiplication uh, and the strengthening the empowerment of uh, under commons. Hmm. Again, if uh, somebody from the audience uh, or uh, from the people following uh, via Zoom uh, has something to say about uh, these questions, uh, he or she is uh, more than welcome. Hmm. Otherwise, it would be interesting uh, to listen to what uh, Stefano hmm, has to say now about uh, Ed Factory and taking stock of a project that was, uh, in a way, an important project, although quite ephemeral. You know. hmm. it, it was an important project. It was a, a big influence on us. And, uh, and I would also say it, it continues to be a big influence I discovered that there were many people in Asia who were very interested in this history of edufacturing and wanted to know more about it, uh, for instance. Um, and I, I suspect that that's, that's true in, in many parts of the world. 
it was an important project, not least because it's the first time I really saw in practice students organize a curriculum and not only organize that curriculum, but then invite the people they wanted to study with. So it was immediate um, turning upside down of, of most of the institutional um, protocols that we were connected to. Around this question related to that of, you know, what does it mean that EduFactory came and then it went? Does it mean that we, we fared, failed to operationalize a, a, a project, a larger project or wider project? Uh, what are the conditions for, uh, for alternatives to, to, to what we would all probably reject uh, this traditional call for quote unquote scaling up? I think we would mostly agree that scaling up is in fact actually scaling down because you lose all the difference, you lose all the energy in the effort to reach some more abstract and uh, hierarchy. So here's where I would, I would say that we maybe would want to almost turn this upside down uh, uh, and the example that, that I'd give is from a book that influenced uh, me and Fred a lot in recent times, a book called The Common Wind. Uh, the Common Wind was written by a scholar called Julius Scott. And what Scott does is he looks at the years before the Haitian Revolution in the Caribbean. And what he discovers is that there's an immense amount of movement across islands, across uh, colonial powers, across uh, languages, he discovers that there is most of all a tremendous amount of communication. And finally, what he shows us is that the colonial powers feared more than anything, this communicability, the fact that often a, a, a market woman in Jamaica was actually speaking not only one or two African languages, but several European languages and became a center of communication across all kinds of movements of enslaved, freed, uh, seamen, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the colonial powers could not suppress this. Again and again, they'd say, before we knew, they knew. And don't forget, they're the ones who think they communicate. They had the newspapers, they had the metropolitan access, etc. And yet again and again, it turns out that the people of the Caribbean, they were in constant communication to the point that there was a kind of communicability. Now, they did all that under the most extreme duress. Many of them, the majority of them, actually fully enslaved. And yet, they had that level of communicability. So one of the things I'd like to suggest is that if you look today at, at the colonial powers of our own colonial powers, they're in the same position. They always know too late. They always know less. They always ask the question of how come we're already in communication. So I'd like to suggest that, that actually our communicability remains as it was then uh, an incredible force uh, in confronting uh, power and that far from having a problem of being cut off from each other or not being able to link project to project or uh, projects running out of steam, in fact, we can, we can perceive a, a, a constant uh, bubbling of, of self-organized activity everywhere which is communicable and is, is greatly feared by power and is an expansion of, of the, the, old, um, the, the old autonomous uh, 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 phrase from Toronto, the workers first send capital. This is an expansion of that. This is, this is, this is society first, uh, then the state or however you want to characterize the power uh, in question. So I, I think there's a, there's an argument to say that we have an abundance of communicability uh, and that that is written in the record of the powers that try to separate us. Um, also, I think 
that that abundance of communicability, um, it can it 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 often can very much show up for us as a problem to us or for us. And what if it's the case that that the regulatory function of the state or of uh, what if it's the case that this is also a way that gives us some understanding of the origins of regulatory function, whether it comes in the form of a state or in the idea of, a, of an individuated self-possessed, self-contained self, that, that all of these are in a weird way, you know, um, regulatory exertions that themselves exist as a function of that unruly communic power of communicability, which is, you know, and, and one way to think about it is that it becomes a kind of, I mean, I guess the reason why I'm saying this is because it, you know, it's not, not lost on us, you know, that it's, that we're speaking at least in some ways connected to, uh, you know, the University of Bologna here and, and, you know, in, in the historic status of that university, which and here's where what I'm saying hopefully will make a little bit of sense because if the the myths of origin of the university are true, then what it's constantly giving us a chance to think about is how it is that this sort of fundamental and deep interaction between the studium and the commune arising out of a kind of spontaneous communicability. We have to deal with, learn the lessons of how it is that regulatory institutional force is exerted in a way that produces the university as an institution, even though it has its roots, you know, in this more spontaneous sort of intellectual communicability. Right, like how 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 do we confront and deal with the fact that the university is is the creation of students, right? That it is the result of the spawn, you know, of the of the into, of the irregular intellectual activity of students. I, I think it's a it's it's actually a chance. Something something is given to us when 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 we are required to address that question. Um, we, we have to, it, it's important for us to, to understand that, that the roots of, of a certain kind of constituent power, of a certain kind of institutional power, that the roots of that can be traced back to our own irregular communicability, right? Which then means that, that the work of care, for instance, that someone like David Graeber, you know, rightly talks about, that, that that care has to be understood as both as 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 having a generative um, ameliorating function, if you will, uh, a, a function of of uh, you know, uh, but it also has to have a degenerating function too. Um, that we have to care enough to constantly direct our degenerative power towards the institutionalities that we inadvertently produce. Um, and this is a specific and particular problem for, for study or for anything that occurs at that intersection, so to speak, between study and, and the commune. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Fred. <laughs> We have another uh, question by uh, Nico that uh, relates to the university. I read the, the question and then uh, we move uh, to Jacob's question uh, that is uh, related to logistics. Hmm. So Nico writes, uh, in the last half decade, student protests, uh, for example, in South Africa, France and Britain, have re-erupted. However, amid calls for lower fees and decolonization, 
One observes rather conservative claims, such as the capping of fees rather than their abolishment, or in South Africa, the reduction of double medium education to only English, the prime colonial language in South Africa. Can we still count on progressive change to come from students? I think it is a question that connects to what Fred was saying. Yes, um, I, I mean, as Fred was speaking, I was also reminded of our friend Josefina Saldana, who wrote a great book called Indian Given. And in that book, where she's going to explore the, 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 the Spanish colonialism in the New World, she begins with an episode, which may be well known to all of you, but was not known to me, in which uh, Sepulveda comes first, is sent first by the church to Bologna to put down a student rebellion before he's sent on uh, uh, to the so-called new world where he, he goes on to do his damage. So, so right from, from the quote unquote beginning, there are these connections as, as Fred suggests in between the commune and studium struggle uh, and, and oppression. Um, of course, it's always important for us to add when we're speaking like this and when we're trying to make connections and communicate with each other that um, there's a limit to some of our generalizations and in different places and at different moments, the struggle in and around universities takes different form. I've been reminded of this recently because I have been living in Brazil and in Brazil, the university is still a place uh, that can act oftentimes, uh, not entirely, but almost as one against the government. Uh, it, 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 um, it maintains an element of refuge that is lost in a lot of other systems at the moment. And that has been brought into sharper relief by the, 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 the crypto-fascist uh, Bolsonaro uh, government. Uh, so sometimes we have to remain conscious of these differentials and of the ways in which the struggles amongst students uh, uh, and where possible amongst teachers is gonna take different forms and have different uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, we, we have always the very peculiar case of that moment when students in many systems around the world uh, come to regard themselves as a kind of class. Uh, and we know the kind of potentials that can emerge at that, at that moment. So I, I, I would never say that there's not potential in, in, uh, in, in student movements. But, but what I would say is that um, those, those are just gonna look very different in different places. And there's a limit, I think, to, um, to, 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 to making broader statements uh, about our, what Fred was pointing to as our strategy um, uh, uh, it, um, across these uh, different jurisdictions. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of, I, I was, I was really thinking of Nico's second question when I was speaking before. Um, and, um, and I think that, um, you know, just to elaborate a little bit more, um, you know, one, one of the, one of the thinkers who, uh, it's it, one of the thinkers who we've been really kind of working well, you know, uh, or sort of under under her influence maybe for many, many years, but certainly over the last years, Joy James, um, a scholar located in the United States. And she's got this notion of what she calls the the captive maternal. And and really what she's talking about going back to to slavery in the, you know, in the so-called new world 
is the condition within which the demands of subsistence on the part of the enslaved require the enslaved to often do a kind of work of reform or maintenance for the very institution that enslaves. Um, now, one way, one, one, one notion that seems that could be said to be implicit in that formulation is that the institution for which in some perverse way the enslaved person becomes responsible, that that institution predates the enslaved person and, and predates the resistance of the enslaved person. But what we're also trying to, to get at, what we're also trying to think about is the ways that in fact, it's more important, it's important for us to recognize that subsistence predates the institution that regulates it. And it predates and comes before the institutional structures that seek not only to regulate, but to exploit it. Um, and also at the same time that, it, that these institutions seek to regulate and exploit subsistence, they also seek to eliminate subsistence. And, and this war on subsistence, which we have come to think about by way of our friend Manolo Callahan, who thinks about it, obviously, by way of Ivan Illich, this, this war on subsistence is the war that we now fight, that we have, you know, all, always been, been fighting. But if one thinks about subsistence as predating the regulatory war that is imposed upon it, then that allows us to, and I'm just thinking now because I'm sort of anticipating maybe an address to, to Jacob's question and to Tiziana's question in the chat, um, but maybe one way, one thing that it helps us to do is to, is to explain the distinction that we make in the undercommons between logistics and logisticality. And by way of a kind of, you know, relatively simple notion that we that we think that logisticality comes first, that we think that the communicability of slave of, of slave resistance comes before the technical um, and regulatory forms of communication that are meant to suppress that communicability. Um, and, and really, it goes back to lessons that we learned kind of from Marx but by way of Foucault, and then again, by way of Michael Hart, you know, that, that resistance is prior to power, that, that worker insurgency comes before um, discipline in the workplace. Now, what that again requires us to consider is that if worker insurgency comes first, how do we understand and what do we do about the origins of worker insurgent, of worker, of discipline in the workplace in worker insurgency, right? In other words, if we say communicability comes first, if we say logisticality comes first, how do we then both explain and deal with the fact of logistics arising from logisticality, of communication, of technical regulatory forms of communication arising from communicability? Um, these are, and, and again, this is a question that maybe we can ask by way of, you know, how did, how did the university as we now know it and experience it arise from this complicated, rich, intense forms of intellectual communicability that seemed to be occurring in Bologna sometime in the late 11th century? Um, and, and, and the other question, that Nico asked, which I guess I'm thinking about that too, is just if we go back and think about that form of intellectual communicability that seemed to be going on in, um, in, in Bologna, you know, in and around Bologna at that moment, out of which the commune or the city and the university seems to emerge, 
the one thing that we probably wouldn't want to ever call that form of communicability would be primitive, right? That, in other words, here would be the place where we could make a really rich distinction between the previous and the primitive. Um, the previousness of our irregular communicability, which would mean that it comes first or comes before the institution in a way that doesn't require us to, to think about it in terms of autochthony or primitivity or really even origin, right? That, it, that it's an anoriginal, you know, communicability, um, a previousness um, that evades, you know, the natal occasion as, as Nathaniel Mackey might say. Okay, I know I just talked too much. I'm shutting up now for at least no. oh, no. 11 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I would encourage now Jacob uh, to jump in uh, uh, to switch uh, the microphone on uh, and to kind of reformulate his uh, question, keeping into account what Fred uh, just uh, said. Just try. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Cool. There we go. Yeah, Fred, you just you covered a lot of the ground. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question how I asked it, just because I've not covered the distance that you've you've, you've already spoke to like to reformulate the question yet. The question was this this formulation of logistics that you put forward, which as you describe is like the you call it like the general de degradation of means in the undercommons and then the sort of like loss of the capacity for sharing in in the new book which i just started this morning um obviously like it runs against the the generalized understanding of logistics being the, the coordination of the distribution of goods um my question was like how do you conceptualize or understand the acts of the co-option of like the distributive or logistics infrastructures um so like the means of distribution or maybe like the means of withholding you could also call it um, so, for example, like what happened in Minneapolis last summer when people took over the Walmart and turned it into a food bank or the rise of the new mutual aid groups, which are very different to the sort of like original kind of like anarchist formulation of, of mutual aid groups, which are basically just logistics operations. Right. Just like who has surplus time and goods and how can we get those to, to you know, where they need to go. So, like some people have called these counter logistics, but I'm wondering how these things fit into or don't fit into your own formulation of, of logistics or logisticality. So, like. How do you approach these acts of the co-option of the means of distribution? And what's the counter logistics to your formulation of logistics? Is it hapticality or something else entirely? And I think you've already covered that to an extent in talking about the difference between logisticality and logistics. But like, this is a question I've struggled with this year. So I'd appreciate, I'd appreciate any thinking you have on it. Is there somebody who wants to add something from the audience or from Zoom? Maybe Tiziana? So let's try to make an assembly and not uh, Q and A. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, it seems that uh, Tiziana has uh, some problem to connect. So maybe Stefan or, or Fred hmm, want to reply to Jacob. Hmm. Ah, sorry, there is a question. Excuse me, I didn't see you. Hello, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't have to have my mask on. Um, just, I guess, riffing off a lot of stuff that was said, I kind of wondering, um, and I apologize because I don't necessarily know a lot of your own personal and critical backgrounds, but, um, how does technology complicate a lot of these things that we're talking about right now? Like, especially I'm thinking about returning to some of the points about 
autonomous organizations and things like that. Um, there are things happening right now with technology, things in like the blockchain and things like that, that are seemingly opening paths for new ways of thinking about autonomous organizations and, and concepts of autonomy separate from logistical systems that currently exist. So just kind of wondering, perhaps the question would be, how does technology complicate these things or doesn't? Anybody else? So, Stefano, Fred, if you want to react to these two questions and comments, they were not uh, only questions. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I think I, I, uh, I understand some of the the the. the the interventions that the, the questioners are making here, and I, I, I'm not promising to be able to answer it all satisfactorily, but I think it, 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 I find it helpful to myself to think about how logistics uh, instantiates itself. Uh, uh, how, does, how do we get to the point where we could say logistics is the movement of goods and services or the the holding up of goods or services or anything else like that. Um, a lot of things have to have to happen. Um, and those things are not incidental to logistics. They, they make up logistics. So for one thing, logistics, after it moves from its military to its commercial phase, uh, becomes uh, uh, the movement of, of discrete pieces of private property. Uh, so it's instantiating that in, 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 in the very idea of what logistics is. It's these discrete pieces of private property. It also instantiates the, all kinds of notions of time, space, and place so that logistics can begin a kind of emplotment of, of its activities. Um, yes, all kinds of technologies at the same time. Yes, also... Um, all kinds of uh, protocols around finance, insurance, and management. Uh, but of course, all of this doesn't happen outside of, 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 of people. It happens in and through people. Now today, maybe we have more of an awareness of logistics because it so clearly is occurring in and through us. But it's always been doing that. And early on, it's, it's two major instantiations through what had come to be called uh, the human. Uh, one was to set, take one set of people and turn them into those discrete pieces of private property, fungible but discrete, uh, in, the, in the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, and the other was to implot people capable of carrying out that trade, managing it, financing it, et cetera. And for those people, what logistics meant was situating yourself and plotting yourself as someone who stood discreetly in a certain time, in a certain space, with a certain perspective, creating all of the protocols of what would eventually become the settler, for instance, uh, and, and the businessman. So, the question that we, we have to ask, I feel like I always have to ask, and the reason that, that, that Fred and I talk about logisticality as, as, as something um, that calls forth logistics it is, is, is how, how deep is this, this legacy in, in today's logistics? How deep is the legacy of implotment of, of, of private property, of, of, of of racial capitalism, etc., and, and can we imagine that uh, we can so easily produce a counter logistics? Um, this is an echo of an old question that we know, you know, from from our studies in Marxism about 
you know, how, pro how appropriate it is to take over the machine. Uh, but this logistics machine is um, a much more insidious one as it certainly couldn't be separated out as easy as a, a crane uh, or a container. Um, so if you ask me about counter logistics, I, uh, I am in solidarity with these things, but I also at the same time believe that until we have a thorough reckoning of the origins of logistics and of how it instantiates uh, forms of what Sylvia Winter, you know, would call the overrepresentation of man, how it instantiates um, the, the private property, how it instantiates um, the buying and selling of, of beings. This is all what makes logistics what it is today. That's what it means when the UPS truck rolls up in front of your door. Um, and so this seems to me uh, not a simple matter of, of countering or taking over. Thank you, Stefano. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, another question. A question from Julia that uh, allows us to move from logistics uh, to finance in a very wide sense. Julia writes, uh, you argue in the under commons that uh, it is not credit we seek, uh, nor even debt, but bad debt, which is to say real debt, the debt that cannot be repaid, the debt at a distance, the debt without creditor, the black debt, the queer debt, the criminal debt. End of quote. So we need uh, to abolish the system of credit in order to stop this debt credit, because what is supposed to be repaired is uh, irreparable. In this way, you argue that we need uh, to build something new. How can we use technologies to build something new and don't go back to a vicious chance if we face a lot of problems related to data? Data is uh, an issue uh, Fred and uh, Stefano write quite uh, extensively about uh, in their uh, last book, uh, all incomplete. Do you have an answer or uh, at least uh, some hints? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, I, 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 it's a fascinating question and I'm, I'm trying to still get a little bit of a way to address it. Um, I, I think I'm trying still to understand, um, the relationship between maybe, maybe maybe the way to address it is to begin to think through the relationship between credit and data um, and to understand how much of the credit economy now within you know the intensity of this interplay between and the, the sort of co-presence really so to speak of what on the one hand we might call logistical capitalism and on the other hand we might call financial capitalism. These things seem entangled and overlapped and um, inseparable from one another. Um, and we might think of this as a, a bad or insidious entanglement. Um, and, and if they are entangled or if they are connected, if they are related, then maybe then data and the technological transfer of data. Um, and not just that, but the reduction of, of communicability, of hapticality, of logisticality to data. Um, all of these are horrific conditions that we, that we face. 
And of course, I think part of what I think Stefano was saying a few minutes ago with regard to the notion of the counter is that if we, the trouble with countering an already existing system is how much of that countering seems to be predicated on the belief in the originality, the originarity of that system and a belief in, again, what I would, you know, what I think we would both call the metaphysical foundations of that, of that system. Um, I guess one of the books that has been unavoidably, you know, even though maybe sometimes we tried hard to avoid it, but one of the books that has been unavoidably influential for us over the last, really since we were undergraduate students together is Orlando Patterson's you know, very great and important book, Slavery and Social Death. Um, and there's a moment in the sort of apocalyptic opening chapter of that book, um, which he titles The Constituent Elements of Slavery. There's a moment in which he begins to try to explain, but only in the briefest possible terms, all of the stuff, why it is that he doesn't attempt to account for what it is that um, for certain things in slavery. He doesn't attempt to account for the kind of communicability, for instance, that a few years later, Julius Scott attempts to account for in the common wind. Right. Um, Patterson is at that moment, at least, concerned. It's not that Patterson is not concerned with the modalities of resistance on the of the figure of the slave, and particularly of the figure of the Caribbean Creole slave, who he later on says is in some ways the most extraordinary figure in in modern history. But ultimately, Patterson's concern with understanding the nature of power, okay, and understanding the relation between masters and slaves as an extension of a certain metaphysical understanding of the relations of power. Ultimately, that concern, right, which is a concern that he can, is a concern that he is, that's primary for him, and it's a concern that can only show up by way of data, right, which is to say that relation between master and slave that is structured by power and structured by an already given power differential between the master and slave only shows up by way of the data that the master collects. Okay. And, and, what's, and what he doesn't talk about, what he seems to be saying that he almost can't say much about are the internal relations within the so-called slave society. He refers to relations between masters and slaves as a field of data, okay? Implicit, I think, is that relations within, so what we might call relations within slave society would be something that shows up for him as lore, let's say, um, rumor, uh, the common wind of, of, of talk, of gossip, all of that irregular communicability that we began talking about, that for him really doesn't show up as the basis or the ground for historical analysis because it's outside the framework of the power structure that's implicit in the opposition of master and slave. Well, if that's the case, then I guess maybe on the most fundamental level, it's not that Stefano and I are uninterested in data. It's just that we're more interested in lore. We're more interested in gossip. We're more interested in the common wind. We're more interested in trying to imagine what it is that the market women, whether they were in Kingston or Abiokuta in Nigeria or you know, Fordyce, Arkansas, you know, in the United States, you know, we're more interested, we're interested in trying to imagine and trying to understand and trying to discern what they said amongst themselves. And we refuse, 
any epistemological formulation which says that that remains on that that must remain unavailable to us because we believe that any epistemological formulation that says that that must remain unavailable to us is itself an artifact and an apparatus of power so so these are these are these are methodological questions at the end of the day um and i guess it means why i guess this kind of points to it's all bound up with the fact that um, independent of the question of whether or not somebody would say Harney and Moten have no discipline, <laughs> you know, maybe as people we're pretty fundamentally undisciplined, you know. Um, but on the other hand, on an intellectual or an academic level, I think it's equally true that we also have no discipline. Um, um, that that the work that we're trying to do uh, is is anti-disciplinary. In that, in that regard. So, any more question or comment? Um, Sa Sandra, there was yeah, a. There is. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is an online question from one of the participants of the summer school, David Rizzardi, and uh, he's asking, I was wondering how would the counter logistical form of art look like and how would it circulate? Um, a second question from the audience. Yeah, so actually, my question is closely related. Um, I was thinking about, you know, when Fred mentioned that resistance is sort of previous to the power that responds to it, it occurs to me that, well, at least when I think about the movements that have had, that have been victorious, that it seems that often it's a matter of the ability to create kind of aesthetic objects, you know, slogans, symbols, narratives, et cetera, that are able to sort of um, create a critical mass that endures past the point by which, um, you know, the responding power, that they sort of run out of resources or they, they just sort of like run out of options um, before, you know, the, uh, this like, aesthetic situation or like like the like motivation that comes from whatever aesthetic object or objects uh loses its, its steam or whatever so what i wonder is you know why it is today that it seems that we're unable to you know it seems like a lot of people recognize what the problems are and yet we can't create the kinds of aesthetic objects or constellations of aesthetic objects to create enough momentum to last past the point um, that would be necessary for victory. I mean, in a lot of cases, obviously there are victories, but I wonder why so often it, that doesn't happen. Please. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe we both take a shot at this because it's a good question, but I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Uh, other than as you were talking, I, I, I was thinking that, you know, we, when, when we study the, when we study the, the history of, 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 of radical insurgencies, uh, what quickly begins to blur is, 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 is as you say, the aesthetics in the movement such that it, it, it's no longer a case that the aesthetics come to accompany the movement or to represent it, uh, but, but to be its practice. Um, I mean, this is, for instance, something that you can see in, in what comes to be called the civil rights movement. Uh, 
the the aesthetic practice of gathering, uh, the aesthetic practice of praying, preaching, or singing, um, starts to constitute the movement, not not represent it or mobilize it or um, or uh, sustain it, um, as it is often portrayed. Uh, and, and this is all all the more the case when when you really learn more about the civil rights movement as it takes place in the Southern United States, uh, we, which, which turns out on a closer examination to be a movement about the, the ability to do this, to gather, to sing, to pray. It, it's not a movement about integration. Uh, it, it's not entirely a movement about getting resources that have been stolen. It's largely a, 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 an autonomous movement of course, the United States could never handle understanding it as an autonomous movement, because it has to join the great American narrative of, you know, uh, progress towards uh, perfect unity. Uh, and, and yet, you know, what if the civil rights movement was a demand that, that you should be able to get together and, and, and pray or, or sing or, or march? Uh, what if that was the demand? Um, and, and in that sense, therefore, the idea of a demand starts to get called into question. And, and I'm not sure you wouldn't find this at a certain moment in the Russian Revolution or in a lot of places that you looked. Um, uh, so what I like about your question is, uh, you know, we start, to, we start to be able to reverse our terms uh, around these things. I mean, I think one of our favorite moments in Marx, the early Marx, is uh, when he just gives us like this little tantalizing, you know, kind of glimpse of what communism might be like, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and you farm or raise cattle in the morning, and then in the evening you engage in criticism. Um, but then there's also another moment of the description where he talks about it. And this is this completely amazing, powerful formulation that, that we still don't understand um, because it appears on first glance to be a statement about, well, he talks about the moment when the senses will become theoreticians in their practice. And it, it feels like, man, that's a formulation which is that's like Marx, the physicist and Marx, the biologist, you know, um, in ways that are that allow you or that require you or that make you want to say that that it is out of this sort of moment of natural philosophy, right, that that the critique of political economy emerges, right? To, to, to think of the critique of political economy emerging out of a moment of natural philosophy, right? Uh, out of physics and biology, you know, that's, that's a, that, what if that, that, that's an enabling thing, it seems, you know, to, to us. And, and what, what, what does it enable? Well, part of what it enables is, is a kind of, uh, I, I mean, I guess, I guess it, it enables us, for instance, to say, what if it turns out that the way that nature is ordinarily thought of as an object of a certain kind of study, what if nature um, or what if natural philosophy is a kind of thinking that at the most basic level comports itself away from the very idea of the object, right? Okay. What if, if the, when the senses become theoreticians in their practice, that's, that seems to be a formulation that's kind of connected to the idea that, that the senses, and more specifically, the sense that we would associate with theory or with theoria, right, the sense of sight, that that seeing, that that Marx is describing um, is a kind of is a practical seeing that isn't in the first instance comported 
towards an object. Maybe it's a kind of seeing that takes place through the object. Right? Not only that the object becomes a lens for that seeing, but that the object disappears in so becoming that, that lens. Right? Um, that, that our thought need not be comported towards objects is a, is a really beautiful formulation, it seems to us. Implicit in that formulation also is that our thought, insofar as it is not comported towards objects, is also not a comportment of the subject toward an object, right? That, that there's something going on in what Marx is saying there that goes against the grain of, of, of the assumption of the difference of the subject and object, and therefore it goes against the grain of the historic philosophical you know, desire slash, you know, task to create a rapprochement between subject and object. It's like thinking is coming from someplace else at that moment with, with Marx. And the fact that it's coming from someplace else at that moment, at a moment when he's trying to understand communism, that's like a cool, that's a clue, you know, that's a clue that, that gives us something to, to consider, you know, something to think about. So, so what might this subjectless and objectless thinking be? And what's the connection between this subjectless and objectless thinking and communism, right? And I'm, so maybe, maybe the problem really truly is the very idea of the art object. Maybe our, our most genuine and authentic communist practice, both on an intellectual level and on a sort of social level is the practice that isn't predicated on the assumption of an object and the assumption of a subject that stands against that object, that sees that object, that seizes that object in seeing that object at, a, at the interplay of epistemological grasp and, and the modality of grasp that we would associate with ownership. So that, so that the, and this would be a place too where what we were saying before, this would be another one of those places, just like Stefano was talking about with the civil rights movement, where our strategy and our ethics merge, okay? In other words, which is to say, if our ethics is that which describes how we comport towards what we want, towards what we work for, then here's the case in which what we're working for is precisely the capacity to do what it is that we do when we're working for something, right? And what we want to do is we want to do that shit out from under the duress, okay, of, of, of power. Um, and, and at the same time, and then there's one, just someone named Netta wrote a really beautiful question in the, in the Q&A part of the Zoom thing. And I, I just thought it was really a question about choice. It was a question that, you know, if what, if what our work is doing is going against the grain of the idea of a subject of history, like in that way that Denise De Silva would put it, you know, our mentor and friend, you know, if what we're go doing is going against the grain, not only of a subject of history, but on some level of an object of, of history, then what, what's the, what's the, what, what's the status of choice is, is what Netta was asking. And, and I think, Maybe this is a difficult question. Um, certainly, there's no question of intent or of consent either. Again, this shows up for us maybe as a question of natural philosophy. It shows up as a physics question. Um, it shows up that what's at stake is not the ma making a choice. Um, it's not even how choice would operate within the framework of, of the uncertain, okay? Um, you know, really what's at stake is, is what it would mean, what it would mean not to choose the indeterminate as if we could make a choice for the indeterminate but rather what it would mean to honor the indeterminate. And, and I know that's probably cheating because maybe 
maybe I'm just folding this question of honoring the indeterminate back into some sort of discourse of choice. But um, but I my sense of it is what it would mean to live with the indeterminate, to, to honor the, the indeterminate operates outside of the normal metaphysical and ethical and political sort of discourses of, of subjects and objects and choices. Um, it's it doesn't work within that political framework that um, anyway I, I sorry Steve man I never asked that question and I call myself trying to answer it and then I get erased it and I just didn't want her to think that you know um, that we were just blowing it off even though what I said I'm sure made no actual goddamn sense. <laughs> I'm scared too because Thank you. I know the game is coming on and I know y'all really have long since stopped caring about what the hell we think about anything. We're, we're just all concentrating on the defeat of Belgium, which is a historical <laughs> imperative, right? That, that must Let's be. see. I mean, it is more complicated than that. <laughs> we'll talk about that uh, after the yeah. game. Okay. <laughs> so time is over, Eva. I think we were quite successful uh, uh, with uh, the experiment of uh, an assembly. Can do better. And maybe uh, we'll have soon uh, the opportunity to host uh, Fred and Stefano in person. And I'm sure uh, uh, this will help us uh, with uh, our uh, experimentation. But for now, uh, let's thank uh, uh, Fred and Stefano for their engagement, for their generosity. It was a, a really exciting session. And I would like uh, to thank once again our partners, uh, the Fondazione Gramsci Emilia Romagna, the Fondazione per Innovazione Urbana. Are you I'd like to thank the translators who did a great job in these two uh, weeks. And above all, I would like uh, to thank and greet all the participants in uh, the summer school, both uh, faculty and, uh, let's say, students, quote and unquote. I hope uh, you enjoyed the summer school, although uh, it was uh, online. I hope uh, you will bring something back from uh, this summer school, but uh, above all, I hope uh, you will uh, keep in touch with uh, the academy and uh, we will have uh, opportunities uh, to meet again uh, in the next months and uh, years. Thank you very much. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both and all. Thank you, Michele. Thanks, everybody. Um, bye, Fred. Bye, Stefano. Bye. Keep in touch. Okay, Definitely. good. All okay. right. Ciao.